Hello and welcome to our FLAF 2024 Q&A panel sessions. My name is Tyler Marcano, concert producer here at the Philadelphia Latino Arts and Film Festival. And I'm gonna be moderating this session with our lovely group of filmmakers here. Um, I'd like to give them the opportunity to kind of introduce themselves and their work before we uh, jump into our Q and A's here. We'll start with Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Del Rio Solorzano. I'm uh, from Mexico City originally, but based in New York City. And my film is I Am Neither Here Nor There. And then uh, Valeria, you can go next. Hi, I am Valeria Casares. I'm the director and co-writer of Exo Marisol. I'm a first-generation Mexican-American filmmaker who wants to explore films about my heritage through a film perspective and explore family ties as well as coming-of-age stories. Rin? Hi, my name is Brittany Rivera. I'm the director of Se by Sus Raices Tainas. I'm also one of the 3D artists that worked on it. And um, my film is basically about uh, sorry, I'm getting nervous all of a sudden. <laughs> um, my film is just highlighting Puerto Rican culture because I'm a New Yorican, and I really wanted to highlight diversity in animation as well as Puerto Rican culture, which is not often seen in animation. Awesome. And Rodrigo? Hi, everyone. I'm Rodrigo Carvaletto. I'm a writer, director, um, queer Brazilian writer, director, originally from Brazil, from an island in northeastern Brazil, but I'm based in LA now. And I am the writer and one of the directors of the film Wishful Thinking. Wishful Thinking is a queer coming out story and it's actually my personal coming out story of how I came out to my family. So I made the film to screen it to them and that's how I shared my truth with them. So to me, it's a lot about like having more representation and very authentic stories around the queer community in the Latino community. So that intersection of my worlds. Awesome. I, we are so excited to be able to ask you guys some questions today. Um, so I know with moderation panels like this, I try to ask questions that I think apply just to, I think, all filmmakers. And I think all filmmakers will have a unique answer to. Um, some of them might sound a little simple, but I come from a filmmaking background as well. And I, I think they're questions that you guys can kind of run with. Um, I think we will... Who would, who would like to go? Who wants to catch the first question first? Everybody's gonna have to answer it. But uh, um, here, let's go. Let's go reverse order. Rodrigo, we'll start with you. Um, but this is kind of a question to all of you guys, because it's always my favorite question, or one of my favorite questions to ask from the kids, which is, um, what exactly was the inspiration for this film? I know you said that wishful thinking obviously is a very personal story, but even then, um, I guess what inspired you to decide even to tell that story in the way that you do? Yeah, that's a very profound question. <laughs> so for wishful, wishful thinking, like I said, it's incredibly personal. It's the way that I chose to share my truth with my family. And living in the closet, it was very interesting because I come from an area in Brazil that still has a lot of like the like macho man kind of the idea, like a, the idea of masculinity. And I never fully identified with that. So I was always in the closet in Brazil. And then I found this safe haven in LA where I could be myself, but it was almost like this bubble that I could only be inside that bubble. That's where I felt safe. So it's almost like my, I had like, I was split between two worlds that like what I could say in one, what I couldn't say in one. And I really wanted to bring my family and people from back home, like into my world fully. So it was actually, I was writing, I started writing the script and I had just a theme in mind and the idea was connection. And to me, the idea of being an immigrant here, being queer and out here, but closeted in Brazil, the idea of being an immigrant and that like a lot of times it's like you're striving to find a place and to really be able to stay. Uh, those ideas of like being connected to two worlds, but at the same time, you feel disconnected to both was really what inspired me. And to me, like writing it was super cathartic. I was like writing because it's it's very personal. Like I actually play myself in the film and my real life partner plays himself. At the time I was writing, I didn't know that that was going to be the case. But writing it, like I went through like joy, sadness, anger, and then finally relief. And when I got to like fade out on the page, it was such a powerful experience that I knew that that's how I wanted to share my truth was like through my art. So that was the inspiration of the process of getting it on the page. That's beautiful. Thank I you. Been... 
Okay, so I wrote my film about four years ago as a student. I went to art school and you're given the opportunity to create a short film that's like three and a half to four minutes. And growing up, um, I have a disabled sister. And if you guys watch any media, there's basically zero representation for disabilities. And it was something that as I grew up, I noticed that our family dynamic was really not seen in media at all. And I wanted to create something that highlighted the experiences that my disabled sister has gone through, as well as the community that we have basically grown up in in New York City um, that highlights accessibility issues, as well as our experience as Puerto Ricans growing up in New York City. Additionally to that, like in Puerto Rico, there has been a lot of history of colonialism, uh, the history is something that is not taught in American education system. I think growing up, Puerto Rico was mentioned in like two sentences in all of my textbooks that I had. And once I graduated public education, I realized that I could finally learn and had the time and space to process the history. And I learned a lot about the Aino culture that I thought was extinct is actually still alive, very much alive today. And I wanted to share that, that this is something that is a part of our, uh, our island's history. So along with our uh, my family's experiences, I also included that history as well as the history that Puerto Rico has faced in recent years of natural disasters impacting the infrastructure of the island and the need that the people have gone through and the resilience as well. That is something that is sort of like an identity that we have created just in order to survive. So all of these different stories came together and thus the story of Seba Isusera Isestainas was born where I created a, a disabled woman of color lead character. I hired disabled actors and it was just a really nice experience to be able to bring all these parts of myself together, but also highlight parts of our community that aren't ever included in medium. Well, that's interesting how those two fuse together and I, and they, it's, funny because they really do you do find a, a very solid way to land both of those concepts in in a solid way in your film I, I, I really do appreciate that that's really interesting to hear um Blair, what about you I've always wanted to showcase uh Linux community in film particularly like the Mexican community community and especially wanted to portray the Latina women and so I based this story around the women I knew and growing up and how the different generations can learn from each other and play with those kinds of dynamics. And so I I wrote it based on that. And I also wanted to particularly highlight um, this young girl, her name's Luna, the main character, um, showcase her youthful perspective and kind of show how everything can be joyous and optimistic from her as she's learning from these other older women. Like I, I, I see there's a heavy themes of um, kind of wanting to put a face to something that you don't see in the medium um, to a lot of these films. And I think that's really honest and really cool because it, it moves the, the, the thing, the needle forward for filmmakers behind us, which is really, really cool. Um, Chris, what about you? Yeah, I'm so excited to watch all these films. I haven't seen them, but they all sound really, really great. And the stuff that we definitely need to have out there. Um, so yeah, my, my film is called I'm Neither Here Nor There. Um, it's about a Mexican baseball player in 1976 who's trying to make it into the major leagues. But at the same time as he's like about to move into like uh, the single A, so like minor leagues, he starts to reminisce a lot about home and specifically his relationship with his twin brother and kind of what he left behind. Um, it was inspired very directly from my family. It's actually kind of loosely based on my dad's experience, like coming to the US when he was younger and trying to play baseball when he was younger. And my uncle who actually passed away in the spring of 2021, which is when I started kind of conceptualizing the film. Um, and I saw the effect that like his death had on my dad because it was pretty sudden. And you know, they spent like most of their adult lives apart. And so that idea of like leaving a close family member like back home was like just really on my mind. And also me as a filmmaker, I like grew up doing sports, like this career ambition and like what you kind of give up to try to strive for a career and like what sacrifices you make and whether those are worth it or not. We're all just like ideas that were swirling in my head. And I kind of just like meld them all together into like this character who's a 
celebration of my uncle and also parts of my dad and also parts of like myself just kind of like trying to put it all together in this 1970s like disco theme mostly just because I love disco music and my uncle loved to dance disco music and so I was like I have to have some disco dancing in there and sports and yeah that's basically you know whether it's um it's really about like whether staying in the U.S. or coming to the U.S. and immigrating is worth it and maybe for some people it's not. I absolutely love all of these answers because like especially like your film for example um I doubt your film stood out for me a lot because I come from a very baseball heavy uh Hispanic family and like that experience is something that is shown in film occasionally but it's not really given the attention and the the nuance to like the emotional is aspects of that kind of a journey and I really really appreciate that I think uh all of your answers really I've seen all your films and it's fascinating to me how an idea that for an audience member like me who has no connection to you this is the first time we're speaking but hearing the details on how personal the stories are almost recontextualize them a bit but also like almost re-cement the the themes that already were very clear and apparent when I watched them which is very 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 cool to hear it's here to how much more personal than things seem on film because of how much work we put into every aspect um I guess my next question for all of you as filmmakers uh, I think we'll we'll start with Valeria on this on this one um I wanted to ask, how did this film specifically challenge you guys as a filmmaker, whether it was the writing process or um, in shooting or what challenges did you encounter new or maybe recurring that you had to overcome that like really stood out for you in this production? Um, for me, just about everything was challenging. Uh, it was my senior thesis film. And so there was a lot of first for me. Uh, it was my first time writing an actual like short film um a first I wrote solo then I brought on a co-writer and so writing solo was the beginning and then also a co-writer was another beginning and then once we moved into production just working on a bigger sized it's still quite small but like on a bigger sized production for what I have done in my past was also just everything was just brand new to me and so I kind of just tackled everything with what I had learned in my classes and read in books and watched in interviews from other, you know, directors and even actors, that sort of thing. And so it was just like a huge learning experience, but I really just loved it, loved just appreciating everything for what it was, taking it for um, a first experience in learning and how to better myself. And I think it was a really great experience in that way because I was just so open-minded about everything. Cool. I didn't know that that was your first film. It's really, really quality. Um, Thank you. Tiffany, what about you? Oh, man. <laughs> I'm on the same boat as Valeria. Like, this was also my thesis film. Um, it was also my first short film. And the whole process was just, like, really big and daunting because it's in 3D. And when you start with 3D, you have nothing. Like, it, you just have a gray square box. So starting with nothing, you have a lot of freedom, but it's also like very overwhelming to go step by step. So for me, the most challenging part was just like creating everything in a very short amount of time, be it the characters, the sets, environments, adding textures to them. Does it look right? Is the lighting okay? And one of the biggest challenges that we actually had was just getting things to work correctly in the 3D program. So I worked with my two teammates, Megan and Jackie. Megan was the primary animator of the whole film. And when you're animating some like a disabled character in a wheelchair and you need a disabled person to reference it and you can't find any online or can't find someone in the city because it's really hard. Um, she was just, we just found a wheelchair and she had her grandma's wheelchair and she was like going in her wheelchair, recording herself, wheeling around and then using that for animation. And then our character has a skirt and our character is sitting in the wheelchair. So the skirt's freaking out and everything is breaking and we only have a week to do everything. So it was definitely challenging just doing all the technical work that you kind of don't consider when you're doing live action filmmaking. Like a person just sits down in the chair and that's it. Versus in 3D, everything needs to be physically accurate and little things add up. But it was so rewarding because 
I realized that I could, I had the power to fix these issues and make things look how I wanted them to versus like if I was holding a camera, there's only so much limitations that I have in a physical real world. While in a 3D world, I can like make the camera zoop and zop and go everywhere. So instead of, it was challenging, but it was definitely rewarding. That's really, really interesting. That's a, a dynamic that I think, uh, yeah, I think as a, a live action filmmaker myself, I, I don't think about, yeah, if I want the actor to just sit down, they sit down. I don't have to think about the vectors like clipping through chairs and things like that. That's a whole other layer that would stress me to no, 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 no end. Um, Rodrigo, what about you? I'm also on the same boat when it comes to a lot of firsts. It was my first film and uh, I didn't go like to film school so to me it was a lot of new things i had been writing for a bit like screenwriting so that was my focus but like again like when i wrote it it felt so personal to me that i decided that that's how i wanted to share my truth to come out to my family that i just went out and like started looking for resources on how to learn about physical production like the most i could and if i like this mentor i got into this mentorship which was amazing and the interesting thing was i had never acted in my life before and the mentor said I don't think this film is going to be the strongest version if it's not you playing it has to be you and she believed in me and I'm so happy that she did because like I got paired with a mentor and we had like zoom sessions on like to, on acting and to me like bringing out like the it was like the first time that I was directing was the first time that I was acting so I'm really really grateful for the team that we were able to put together like there was a lot of trust I had an amazing co-director who really understood the soul of the film. So on set, like we could communicate very clearly on that. But to me, thinking like on challenge, and it's it's a very rewarding challenge. But to me, the moment like where I have like the coming out speech, and for those of you who haven't seen the film, like I'm looking directly into camera, because that to me that was the the vision of like me seeing my parents, my family watching it, and I really wanted to be me talking to them. So shooting that scene again it's very personal so it was like a lot of like myself in it but there was a lot of acting because i had to put myself in that situation that you know like as a queer person closeted for years you're kind of like you have so much anticipation of that moment and i knew that i wanted it to be very genuine talking to my family so putting myself in that headspace be very genuine be very communicative like as much as i could like how can i really bear my soul here uh, but it's on, on the set, it's in front of the camera. So that was like one of the most challenging things, but I'm really happy with how it turned out and how we, we were able to create like that environment that I felt safe to just be myself and really be in that vulnerable spot. Wow, yeah, I can see that being challenging for sure. I remember that being a very impactful moment. That like it is, it is a very impactful moment in that I was actually gonna after the Q and A, kind of make a note of that of like that when he when you just spike the camera and it's it's just for, it's for such an amount of time that like it's almost inescapable like you have to it's like you're forcing the audience to confront this I I don't know I I'm a nerd about this stuff but I I, I remember what you're talking about and that is very interesting I can see how that'd be extremely challenging I didn't know you directed and uh, I I didn't put the two together that you were <laughs> the lead so to direct for your first project and act in it uh is, that is a challenge in itself um so yeah. <laughs> i commend you for that thank you what about you i um i had so many difficulties on this production so it's not my first short film um it is part of a. am in film school as well right now i'm getting my master's degree and i guess part of the complication was that i was on the school timeline um and i had to shoot by a particular date and cast by a particular day and then casting was a little bit difficult. I got really lucky with my actor, had a great collaboration, um, but it was actually kind of hard to find Mexican actors in New York City, which is a little surprising to me. Um, but I really wanted to get this like cast of, you know, truly Mexican actors with Mexican accents in the film. And that was really important. And also someone who was athletic. Um, and I found a boxer who didn't know how to play baseball. So that was an interesting challenge <laughs> to kind of like uh, teach him how to pitch. And he did such an amazing job, honestly, from no not knowing anything to being able to at least see, it, you know, to see like full little people uh, in terms of him being a baseball player. Um, but then, you know, getting into production, 
we actually had to stop halfway through my production because of COVID. My production designer got sick and the school was like, you can't keep shooting because everyone's going to get sick. And then there was this huge Omicron wave in New York City. So they like paused our productions for two months. So I ended up having like essentially two different crews. If you look at my at my credits, it's like I have like two sound mixers, two cinematographers, two script supervisors, like a whole bunch of people in my crew had to change once I got my like new dates, like two months later, I was like worried about like, you know, people's hair had changed. I had like actors who had mustaches, like, please don't shave your mustache. Like it's really important for the 1970s. Like it needs to be consistent. Um, our, we had a production man, it like snowed on our very last day. So once we finished production, went through all these hurdles, um, our passenger van got like stuck in the snow on a hill. <laughs> it was like 1 a.m. So we just had like, you know, just like, Every, everything happened. We shot on film. We had problems with the camera, um, making a period film on a student budget. That was certainly a huge challenge and finding the location. So yeah, it was really kind of like a miracle that it all came together. Um, but it was by far like the biggest kind of uh, production that I've done. And so it was a lot of, I kind of like let myself like go a little bit crazy in terms of making a bigger production and seeing if I could do it. And that was definitely a big challenge, but I'm really happy that it came together. Wow, yeah. I, the, I, I, I mean, I almost asked the question knowing like, yeah, period is definitely hard. Um, but to, to hear all the, the production crisis and, and, and all of that, like it is truly, it is a beautiful film. I like, I, it is one of my favorites solely because it focuses on that baseball story, like you said, and like to do a period with a two month gap in the middle of your production. That would, yeah, that would, that's quite a monkey wrench. I'm yeah. so glad that it came to the quality it did because wow. Yeah. I think I would give up. <laughs> I'll be honest. I've, I've done, I've done the, the dance as well. And in the middle of shooting two months that I can't shoot yeah. anything, that's, yeah, that would be. It really, it did feel like the universe testing me a lot of like, do you really want to be a filmmaker? Like, are you sure? Let's throw another, you know, another fire for you to like handle. Like, are you, do you still want to make this movie? I was like, yes, like, please let me finish it. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, it was really, we all had to power through it, but I'm, I had a really amazing crew and like all of like my collaborators at NYU were just like, so just with me the whole time and I couldn't have done it without them. So yeah, it, I had a lot of help along the way. That is so awesome. All right, this next question is my personal favorite question. And it seems a little simple again, but I do think that, that it always comes up with, there's always some sort of story, even in the most simple. Um, I'm gonna start with Brittany. How, how did you land on your title? How did we come to the title we got? Yes, okay. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on recently with these animated films, but they all have one word titles. It's always, it's like Coco, Tangled, Frozen. Uh, like, give me the long titles. So I remember when I was creating my film, I was like, do I just call it Seba? Nah, that's really boring. And it's not capturing like the history that I wanted to carry and the multiple meanings that the Seba tree has in Puerto Rico. So I remember I was looking up for my film, like, what's the oldest tree in Puerto Rico? It's the Ceiba tree. There's one in Vieques that's like 500 years old. Um, and when you do the math, that is pretty much around the same time that the Tainos were invaded by uh, those like Spanish col col colonialists. So I was like, all right, I want to have the Ceiba tree be something that's important. And I'm going to have my character's house be on it. And her name is going to be Ceiba. But what else is important? And just looking up the history and the importance of the Seba tree and what it meant to the people back then and how it still lives on today and has withheld like so many natural disasters. I wanted it to be a long title and I landed with Seba y sus raíces tainas. That way it has multiple meanings. Like my character Seba, her wheelchair is made of the Seba tree. She lives on the Seba tree. She is one with her environment. And also the tree itself is something that holds our culture together, whether we realize it or not, and is a reminder of keeping that history alive today, that we can withheld anything and go through anything with our resilience. So Seve Sus Reises Tainas is in itself just referencing many different things. I love that you point that out, that you went the opposite direction, because I, I kind of agree, like, 
the the one word title it wouldn't it wouldn't hit the same yeah it, it also like the saber tree is something that is throughout latin america as well um many every country i think has it so i did want to tie it back into the caribbean i love that see i'm telling you it's a good question i always say i always worried about it but it's always comes out as a good question what about you rodrigo i saw you made a face no, I just love that question. It's a question that I think is the first time I got asked that question and I really like it. And it's interesting because, because of the nature of the project, um, it, it forced me to kind of go deeper into the closet to then come out of the closet. Like when I was doing like the crowdfunding campaign and all of that, I could say what the project was, right? So when I first wrote it, it was funny because the name of it was International Closets because it was the idea of being like separated between two worlds and being in closets, but having to be in closets in both. But I couldn't say that in like the crowdfunding campaign and all that. So wishful thinking actually came from like, what is the mock title that I want to call it? So I can tell it to people and like, because my family saw the crowdfunding videos, they pitched in and they share with friends. So I actually had to make like a closeted pitch deck that like would not show, like I, I pitched it the idea that it was about a character looking for his identity and authenticity between two cultures. So the theme was there. I just didn't say what it was about. So wishful thinking kind of came off of that. But again, for those of you who haven't seen, like the film has to do with like a birthday. It's a magical birthday wish. So every time the character makes a birthday wish, he's like teleported between Brazil and the US in a Groundhog Day-esque kind of time loop. So wishful thinking actually, like after I did the whole crowdfunding campaign and I was working with that, it was just perfect because as you're thinking about coming out, you have all those wishful thinking scenarios that you're like, I wish things would go that way. And I wish things would go that way. They don't always go the way you would think, but you always have that wishful thinking. And the the idea that it's a birthday wish, to me, it just married perfectly. And it's funny because international clubs to me now feel like very, very cold and like technical. And wishful thinking has that magic that the whole story has. So it's interesting because I it kind of stumbled into this title as a mock title and I just came to love it <laughs> that is a crazy story on how you stumbled into it and I I agree I I can't even I can't even put international clauses over yeah. the film that's in my memory like <laughs> I that's that's a great story um Chris what about you I always struggle with titles to be honest I'm never quite like super happy with them um, this one for the longest time was called Fernando, which is my uncle's name and who I kind of dedicated the film to. Um, but as I like, I, I had a hard time with the edit. I kind of reconfigured the short quite a bit and kind of rewrote it a lot and tried to simplify it to like its its essence, I think, in terms of like that feeling of leaving home and not being like fully complete. And so I guess that idea of like being kind of like Rodrigo's talking being in between places was really what felt like it was at the center of the movie and I wanted the title to just reflect a little bit more what the theme was and so in Spanish I, I titled it Ni estoy aquí ni estoy allá which is um, ni, allí, ni allí ni allá is like a common phrase we use in Mexico and in I don't know if in other Latin American countries but um, it's kind of like yeah neither here nor there and if I felt like that wasn't quite enough like I wanted my character I think is a little bit in like this like dreamlike state and like very kind of like inward reflecting like reflecting on his experience and kind of debating it's very internal generally and so I wanted to portray this idea of like you're not here and you're not there because you're kind of like mentally elsewhere or mentally in between them so I kind of changed the ni allí ni allá to ni estoy aquí ni estoy allá um, which translates to I am neither here nor there. Yeah, that's, again, I can see how, like, the original title fits um, with the way that you came to the film. But that, that is interesting that with that that post-production process. And it was also, I think, a, a part of the filmmaking that I think most a lot of people don't realize how much something can change from writing to production to post-production. Like, a film can become an entirely different thing. Um, but I... I I think it it is true that that you almost not that you stripped away that personal aspect by changing the title, but you you boil it down to a more like almost universal idea. 
um, that I think really carries really, really well with the film. Yeah. Last but not least, Valeria, how did you, how did we land on? Uh, so Ex Somebody's Soul is a title and it was born because when I was thinking of the idea for the movie, I came across on the internet somewhere of like someone found a letter that someone had addressed to someone else and they posted on the internet asking like who wrote it, like they wanted to give it to who it was meant to be for. And I thought that was a really fun idea. And then I started thinking about like sign offs that you would put on the letter. And EXO just really stuck out to me for some reason. I thought it was really cute. And so I thought of a name that rhymed with that essentially, where it's just how I landed on Marisol. But it turned out to be like a really nice name because Soul translates to sun. And in the movie, she's kind of serving as the guiding light to the protagonist. So I thought it was like a nice little full circle moment. That's what I love. I think it's it's filmmaking is just those little happy accidents. It's even with all these stories, like you you kind of stumble into the thing that just fits. Um, I love that. All right, I have like one more question. Um, before we wrap this up, we're coming close to our, our timer, but I want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to answer this one, um, which is just simply, I think we'll start with Valeria since we're already here. How do you hope audiences will react to your film? Like, or at least uh, if that's not the best phrasing, sometimes I like to phrase it. How do you, what do you hope audiences get from your film when they watch it? I think the biggest takeaway that I hope audiences get is just a sense of wonder and curiosity um, having an eagerness to explore uncharted waters without fear or hesitation um, about what others may think, especially when it comes to cultural expectations and, and family expectations, learning to just live for yourself and try new things. I love that. What about you, Chris? Um, it's interesting. I, I think generally the films I've made, I've always had a very specific emotion that I, I felt that I kind of didn't know how to put into words and wanted to like transplant into a film and just like see if that like through the medium of the story if it like makes you feel the same way and I definitely was trying to do that with this film and it's been interesting to just show it to people and I think the the best responses I've gotten to this so far have been from immigrants and from like Latino immigrants specifically who kind of are just able to relate to it and kind of say things like oh like I really like it reminded me of my dad or like it like reminds me of me and my brother or like I played baseball growing up with my brother so like this really like hit home for me um so it's it's just interesting I think as long as there's like some kind of emotional connection that's kind of all I want the audience to do and it's really interesting to see how they bring themselves into it and it's super rewarding to hear I've had a few people come up and tell me like, oh, like I have had this specific experience and like your film made me kind of like reflect on that. And so that's the like, most rewarding thing to hear. Brittany, what about you? Definitely the feeling of echale ganas, like keep on going, find your community and revel with them. Um, understanding one another is something I also hope to to come from this film. Uh, my character goes through like a really deep monologue where she relates to this other supernatural being and they bond over this and I think it's something that as Latinos we always find the little things that we connect with one another and highlight our experiences and realize we're not so different after all so I hope that my film continues to promote that message as well as inspires people to to educate themselves on the Caribbean and its history and be open to learning more about people aside from themselves and other experiences that are happening around the world. Uh, and just feel also that sense of magic and wonder that we have on our island and that our culture brings to people. So yeah, that's pretty much what I hope comes out of it. Maybe more, more, more stories. <laughs> I like that, more stories. Uh, Rodrigo, what about you? I would say like a key word that we had in mind for the whole process for which we'll think it was empathy. Like through the whole process, uh, a lot of people, like, as we were crewing up and finding the actors and everything, they I would tell them the project and that's how I wanted to come out to my parents, right? And they would be like, you're crazy. <laughs> you're crazy that you're doing that. Like in a nice way, they were like, oh my gosh, that's insane. 
But to me, I always went back to this advice that I got from a professor who said, we are not in the industry of entertainment. We are in the industry of empathy. So to me, like, I really wanted the film to be a bridge for specifically my family. So they would be like, they're like in this island separated from my identity. And I didn't want them to have to cross the ocean and swim. If I just like shouted from the other side, be like, hey, I'm gay. You know, I feel like that wouldn't carry all the meaning, all the struggle I had to go through to like really be who I am and really love myself. So to me, the film is that bridge that I'm building for them out of love and out of empathy for them to empathize as well. So, and what I've been loving about like the reactions and the comments from audiences is that even though it has a very personal aspect to it, like it has, I can feel like the impact and how it's been expanding beyond my own experience. I had someone like he was a fam filmmaker from Brazil who's here in the US as well. And he said that after watching my film, he knows that that's how he, he knows that that's how he wants to come out to his family. And to have that kind of impact like means so much. So, and it's that idea of empathy, not only in my personal sense, but in the personal, like the, when people are watching, feeling that empathy for someone else's experience and build empathy around them. So for sure, empathize and understanding, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and just, yeah, be more empathetic to others. That's a key part of it. Love that. Honestly. Uh, I mean, what what do we make film make film for other than to like let other people take it and run with it, right? Um, it's almost I, I I struggle with that idea a lot when I was leaving film school. Is the idea of like once it's yours, once you're done with it, it's not really yours anymore. Like you raise it to a certain point and then just kind of you let it go. You have to let it go and let it be interpreted for the way what way it is. Um, but yeah, I honestly thank you guys so much. For letting me have this conversation i just got to do my little outro here um part of that outro is going to be giving you guys an opportunity if you have anything you wanted to talk about that i may not have covered or you had anything you wanted to plug or anything specific um feel free to jump in um when you hear it in my little monologue <laughs> on on my way out here but i do want to say thank you guys so much for speaking with me honestly getting to talk to you all was super super interesting and very very exciting um at least for me, I'm a nerd. I love, I've seen every film that has been submitted. Like I, I love this stuff. So uh, let me go for it. <laughs> Before we close off our session, I'd like to take this time to open the floor. If anybody has anything they'd like to add to the conversation, is there anything else you'd like audiences to know about you or your work or any work you have on the way? I just wanted to say I'm really appreciative to be here and to be talking to all of you. So thank you so much for the platform for really championing our stories. And let's keep making films. <laughs> um, thank all of you guys so much for your time today for the panel. Um, I'd like to remind audiences that you can learn more about FLAF by visiting our website at flaf.org. And thank you for joining us. And stay tuned for more updates from the Philadelphia Latino Arts and Film Festival on our Instagram. Facebook, LinkedIn, and or our website. Um, keep on the lookout, guys. Thanks so much.